Good morning. Good morning. morning. All you lovely, lovely people. Good morning. Welcome this morning. And happy birthday. Remind me your name. Camila. Right? I said it for. Um, if you think about it, at some point today, uh, wish happy birthday to Miss Camila. Uh, it's her birthday today. Um, and she was super excited when she came in early this morning saying, Pastor, it's my birthday. And so, happy birthday. Uh, we want to honor you in that. Um, this morning, if you would like to read scripture, I got two chunks of passages to read. If that's you, I'm just going to go whose hands I see first. Um, We'll do that. Okay, I see you two right there. Um, Some of y'all were slow. First of all, and we'll get there. If you have uh, your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 19. We'll be there for a chunk of time this morning. Um, if you don't have a Bible, I invite you. There's a, a stack of them there under the coffee sign. Um, or if you love to be on your phone, which I know there's a lot of people in here that love to do that. I would highly suggest you're on your phone in God's word or taking notes to help you in your pursuit of the Lord. Or if it becomes a distraction. Which for me, sometimes my phone is a distraction. Just turn it over. Um, So you you got somebody trying to hit you up or phone call coming in. It's less of a distraction. Um, So we are in the middle of a series, week number two, um, called Mission R4, of which uh, the four R words, reach, renew, rebuild, and... Return, and we are going through kind of trying to get a grasp out of what Jesus's mission was on earth, and then as a result, what our mission should be about as individuals, and then collectively as the church, as a family, as the revolution, what our mission is collectively as a community. And that begins to inform what we do, and how we do what we do. So, with that being said, last week we looked at the first one, which was reach. And we saw that the main thought coming out of that was that Jesus went out of his way to reach you. And by extension, or as a result, we will have to go out of our way to reach others. Jesus went out of his way to reach you, and as a result, or by us following him, we'll have to go out of our way to reach others. We'll have to get out of our comfort zone, or we have to move from where we may normally engage. We may have to do some things that require effort, or sacrifice, or or compassion, or or, or hard words that are accompanied out of love following Jesus on mission. But there's a question that we should ask ourselves. We should ask of scripture. We should ask of Jesus and maybe even ask ourselves is if Jesus went out of his way to reach you, we need to ask the question, why? Why did Jesus do all and more of what we discovered from Scripture last week. Why did he do it? What is the purpose behind it? Why did he come? Why did he humble himself? Why did he give up his privileges and rights? Why did he take on the role and form of a servant? Why did he love those that didn't love him back? Why did he endure humiliation and ridicule and persecution? Why was he obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why did Jesus reach? This is a question that I want us to begin to 
explore and answer today. So as a result, um, the person who's got Luke chapter 19 on the paper, 1 through 10, um, could you go ahead and read that for us, please? Okay, let's pause there just, just for a second. Thank you, Lexi. Um, so last week, we, we talked a little bit about Matthew. Um, and as a tax collector, or maybe it was a couple weeks ago, the, 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 the drama, what, why, why would Scripture put out that he was a tax collector? Why is that more important than just he was a UPS worker? Um, reason behind that was they were often corrupt, they were oppressive in the amount of taxes they were taking from people, and it says here that Zacchaeus was rich off of collecting fees, taxes, all that kind of stuff, almost maybe kind of quasi-mafioso, shakedown uh, type of thing to get money, getting rich off of everybody else. So there is a feeling about who tax collectors were in general, and then Zacchaeus is one of those that is in the upper echelons of tax collecting. So you can kind of, if you're getting, you know, stuck up for all this money, I use that <laughs> loosely, um, you're feeling a certain type of way about that person or that, that career, that job, that, that, that thing that is taking place. But then when you see someone who is ultra rich off of the backs of you and your people, you're feeling even more certain type of way about that person, all right? So that's a little context. That's important context. We don't see it the, quite the same way. We don't have that type of system necessarily here um, in our, our democracy setting. Uh, but that's what was in play culturally and legally in, in their time. So continue on, Lexi, please. Okay, let's pause there. What's going on here? Try to put your put yourself there in the crowd, and you and it's a, it's a crowd so thick that short Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus, so he climbed up a tree. What what's going on? What would what would the crowd be thinking? What? Talk to me. What do you think? What? Okay. Good. Good. Why him? Why him? Okay. Climbing a tree would be kind of unrespectable for his stature, I would think. Good. Oh, great observation too. So, what the, what does that say about Zacchaeus? That he's trying to get close close to God. Okay. Very good. Very good. So you're 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 on the realm. So so here. We got, have this stature, not only height and stature, but his position as a rich man climbing up a tree. So his stature in the community, climbing up something that would be beneath him, beneath those people in that economic thing, that they climb in a tree to see somebody. There is what's... What's beginning to be at work in Zacchaeus that would cause him to do that? Wanting to see Jesus. He's humbling himself. Humbling himself. Woo -hoo -hoo. Desperation. And desperation. Oh, there's so much there. There's so much there. Um, good. So then what does Jesus say? What, what's what's Jesus' response to Zacchaeus? He calls his name, tells him to come back down. Okay. Don't miss that he called him by name. 
Sometimes if you're reading scripture, uh, particularly Old Testament, though there's some in the New Testament where there's genealogies and lists of people, it can get really long and very boring. <laughs> um, and yet they're there with importance. Just as your name is important, when somebody calls you by your name versus ma'am or sir, but calls you by your name, there's a, 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 um, a beginning of an intimate relationship, not an inappropriate relationship, a, a, a more direct, personal relationship. There's also a deep level of respect. Very good, very good. So what does, what does he ask Zacchaeus? To do besides getting out the tree. Okay. All right. Very good. So Zacchaeus just kind of eventually came out the tree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. Sorry. That went down the wrong way. <laughs> Yes, he quickly came out of the tree and what? With <coughs> what might that have to say for us in our reaction to Jesus? <clears throat> Why didn't he pick me, Daggone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure that there were people in the crowd that had that jealousy or that little envy <laughs> going on. Because you, you gotta go ahead, Lexi. I think that means we should have some urgency when it comes to people. Mm. Mm. Or it's like to get out, to get at mm -hmm. There is a element of an altered uh, plan. Like it altered it altered Zacchaeus plan that day. He didn't come to the the um, ceremony, the parade, the what, the the interaction with Jesus, thinking he's going to have somebody in his crib that day. It changed his plan, so he had to be willing to change his plan, and with a measure of urgency, like it, it engaged his plan. Okay, good. Continue on in uh, that passage. I think it's verse seven, Lexi. Yes, okay. Okay. But the people were displeased. He has gone to Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Okay, pause right there. What's taking place? Write that down to me. What's happening? Repentance. Repentance. How do you see repentance taking place? Very good, very good. So the, the issue isn't the dollar amount here. And the issue isn't even dollars. It was his heart. You begin to see this happen. What's the crowd doing? They're angry. Why are they angry? Okay, very good. <laughs> Don't you know Jesus? <laughs> this something, something, something. Um, right? All right. So, uh, Lexi, verse ten, if you could. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. All right. Very good. Um, so let me real quickly. Um help you out here or remind you, uh, you might have already known, um, here Jesus says, for the Son of Man, this is a, a title or a, a name given to Jesus. Jesus uses it as he did here, and he's referred to uh, Son of Man, that phrase, that title, um, multiple times in Scripture. And it's a, 
it refers to his humanity, his humanity, and his humility. I was combining those two things: his humanity, humility, his deity, and it was a fulfillment of prophecy in Daniel. Um, so here we have the Son of Man, and there's a big word in verse ten, and it is the word lost. Um. We're going to park here for a minute because it's important for answering the question, why does Jesus reach? Our world, our earth is broken. Help me out. How do you see that creation or the earth where we live is broken? I'm not talking people. We'll get to that in a minute. But how do you see, how do you think, how, how do you see that? It's broken. All these actions going on. Flood, oh. earthquakes, the hurricanes. All okay. The, all the seasons. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Anything else? Uh, crime. Crime. Okay. That's coming into the people, but that's good. We'll get there. We'll get there. Very good. Very good. Or lots of depression. Good, good. We see it in the pollution of rivers and streams and ground and air and so on and so forth. We could see it, some people would say climate change or whatnot. Um, I haven't lived multiple centuries to understand how things might be non that, but I have lived enough that I know just in my lifetime, spring isn't spring like it used to be. Um, just from a gardener's perspective, um, spring isn't like it used to be, and winter isn't like it used to be. Now, whether that's a cyclical, I, I, that's not part of my discourse, but we do see changes. We do see we live in an industrial uh, area, and we see from BP to um, the different steel mills, accidents take place, or things not done to prevent accidents from taking place, to the pollution that takes place as a result. Um, things are changing. Our world has lost its original intent and its purpose. It was created by God and gifted to mankind to live on and live in and to be in fellowship with God. And man turned it over to the evil one through sin, the fall, and our continued sin. And it, be, and it has an impact on our earth, on our world. But the world is not just broken. Humanity is broken. Humanity is lost. We are originally created by God, and we are by right because of his creation, his. And we, too, humanity, lost our original intent and purpose. God's design was that humans would live in harmony and fellowship with each other and with God. And we were to experience together the beauty and joy of his creation. Now, from your perspective, how do you see that humanity is broken? Shoot them all. Selfishness. Selfishness. Okay, good. Yes? For, for me, I don't see that the world is broken because it's still the Garden of Eden out there and we just lost the connection. We're just so scared to get dirty. We're so scared of a lot of things that that's why we're, we're out of touch with the world. So we, we are in the world. We don't have to be part of it spiritually, but we are part of it physically right now. And I just, I think the disconnection is so, to me, is obvious, and that's why it's so many diseases, which goes back to like mm -hmm. science. But I just wanted to kind of say that because like, I see a little bit different perspective. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little twist. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, that gets to a point of us trying to like, <laughs> move out when we haven't graduated uh, <laughs> from this place. Like, mm -hmm. like, we're like, oh, I'm tired of here. I want to just pretend like nobody else exists and I don't have a role or a purpose here in this, this space because I'm 
hopeful for what is to come and for God's new creation, for uh, what eternity has to offer that I just, you know, don't do my responsibility here. But for humanity's sake, it's brokenness. How, how do you say selfishness was brought up? How else? Crime. Crime. Very good. Good. What else? Poverty. Poverty. Ooh. Idol worship. Suicide. Idol worship. Suicide. Good. Good. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Woo. Mm hmm. Satanism. Yeah. What'd you... Satanism. Satanism. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, you, uh, um, um, systems and policies that are oppressive, okay? So like rich oppressing the poor, the strong oppressing the weak, or the connected oppressing those that don't have the connects. Um, greed corrupting businesses, or economic systems, or the things that people produce and, and put together to um, work through things, so uh, politics broken, um, selfishness in politics. Right now, big thing in politics. Both parties are at each other and are trying to work out a solution because to get a solution doesn't help their own tribe defeat the other tribe. Mm -hmm. And so it's about their own tribe, not about a collective solution, and that's brokenness. That is lostness, bitterness, envy, lust, hatred, hurt, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So we need to ask ourselves, as we understand, we all understand that hum humanity is broken, that it's lost. It's lost its original intent and purpose. There's some elements that we do, but it, we're by far not what God had created us to be and how to operate because of sin. The question is, how do we get this way? Disobedience to God, rebellion against his authority, unbelief of his word and his warnings. Adam and Eve, if I could put it in words, it's like, why, why is such a big deal, God? I'm just following my own heart. That fruit was good to eat. It sure made me feel good. I'm just following my natural desires. How could any of that be? How could uh, any of that be bad? And why would there be consequences? We are lost, both born into sin and we actively sin, missing the mark. The result of being lost is this. Loss of how God designed the original family, the family of God. What we went through a couple months ago what it means to be in fellowship with God and each other, God's original intent, that has been broken. Lost in terms of physical death, lost in terms of eternal death, lost in terms of judgment and condemnation for sin. God must, because he is holy, he is righteous, he is perfect, judge sin. So that is lost. That is what's lost and what are the results of that. It has an impact on our earth, our surroundings, our neighborhoods, and it has an impact on us personally and as a community in terms of people. So in verse 10 of Luke chapter 19, it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those that are lost. Jesus came to seek. Do you know what the word seek means? It's not something we say normally in our everyday Fine. language. Fine. Okay, good. What else? Look for. Look for? Good. Good. Okay, so why did... Why did Jesus have to come looking for us? Let me, let me rephrase that. Sometimes, and I've been there too, sometimes we're like, 
Well, if somebody needs something, they should come looking to me because I got the answer. Mr. Brown, he's got, the, he's got the tools and he's got the wisdom. And if somebody needs, you know, how, how to put in a door, they should, they should come seeking me. They should come find me out. They should look at that door. It's all crooked. I could have told them how to do it, but they didn't come ask me. You know, <laughs> why didn't Jesus approach humanity that way? Okay, we stubborn, we do it ourselves, good. I think he wanted to show his heart, like, not in, like, from how you were mentioning, not us coming to him, but him coming to us. Um, he wanted to show us, like, his, his heart, and, like, he means it. It's not like it means what he does. Like, mm-hmm. It's true. Mm-hmm. Good, good, good. Um, so we probably all have experienced in some form or way two different ways of, of engaging this, where someone who had the answer or had the help or had the means by which to give assistance, and that may divorce from your mind anything monetarily, um, just in terms of know-how, all right? And it would sit back and they'd cross their arms and just like, I just wait and see if they ask me. And then, and then when you do something that's not right or could have been better or missed the mark a little bit or the door is crooked, man, look at that door. If you would have just asked me, la, 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 and just dog you out, just, you know, just get after you. We probably have experienced that in one form or another. Maybe it's even a teacher at school um, that may have done that. Um, we may have also experienced someone that said, do you need help? Is there something I can do to help you? H have you thought about this? Could you consider, how's it going with that, that essay that you're writing? Do you, do you get what the question is asking? And we might have experienced that and the difference of impact. So that is part of what Jesus is doing here in seeking. The other part is this, sin blinds us. And when you're blind, and then with blindness comes an arrogance that, man, it's not that bad. I don't need any help. I'm good. Sometimes we need a upside the head. We need someone that comes and brings the truth to us that, you know what? No, that door is not okay crooked like that. We need to fix it. Um, no, it's not okay that you turned in a essay that you cheated off of um, somebody and copied it. We, we got to fix it. Um, whatever the case may be, um, we get blinded by sin and humanity is deceived by the evil one, by sin and a wicked heart. So Jesus has to seek us out. There's an incredible about the love there to seek out someone that is like, I ain't trying to hear you. I'm not, I, I need you? No, I'm good. I'm good. Well, I, I say, well, sometimes you're so deep in sin, you give up hope. Yeah. You're like, nobody can help me now. I might as well keep going. Once you cross that line, the world will play with you. So you got to be, you know. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So here comes a follow-up question that we need to pursue is, okay, Jesus reached out. Why did he reach out? Because humanity is lost. He sought us. He seeked us. Seeked us. He sought us. Um, he went after us. Um, why? The purpose behind it is to save. He loves us. He loves us. Absolutely. And, and he loves us, the ultimate form of loving us is to save us, to redeem us, to be saved. So um, during the Super Bowl, there was uh, a particular ad. Um, it was a foot washing ad. Um, and there's a lot of like online controversy about what it was about and what it is. Is it who's behind it? Is it 
is it affirming certain uh, lifestyles and and actions that are uh, contrary to uh, a biblical God honoring way of living life and what's going on and I'm not here to wade into that controversy other than to say <clears throat> Jesus loves us not to co-sign our mess. Sometimes in our current cultural climate, we have cheapened love to say, you love me, you honor me, you respect me, you don't hate me when you co-sign my mess. Or you don't say anything about my mess. To say something about my mess means you are degrading who I am in my humanity to the point of you actually hating me. That is a deep, deep air and a blindness from sin and a nasty uh, uh, stronghold of the enemy in our culture currently. Jesus comes to love us. The picture of foot washing is a humiliating thing of what, what it meant for Jesus in the time and in the culture to be humiliated in washing dirty, stanky, nasty feet as a rabbi. Absolutely humiliating experience. Um, and that picture is an amazing picture of Jesus' willingness and example for his disciples to love and serve people, but it's not just to prop up what they want to do, because the purpose is for their redemption, for their salvation. For their renewal. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 through 17. Go ahead, Joanna, if you will. In the way Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for, for them. So we have stopped, we have stopped evaluating others from human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new life has begun. Very good, thank you. In verse 17, there's an A word in there. What is that A word? Anyone. 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 So it, is there a qualification for anyone? No. No. Other than are you a person? <laughs> are, are, you a, are you a human? If you're not AI, you're, you're, not, you're not an animal, you're not those type of things, and I don't want to get into furries or furbies or whatever that weird stuff is. Um, you are a human homo sapien. You are that is a anyone. Doesn't matter any other classifications that get put on humanity. Gender, class, race, religion, language, age, intellect, clothes, etc. Redemption is possible, renewal is possible, because the power to redeem isn't within the per person, it's in Christ. So, as we think about that scripture, if anyone is in Christ, he, she is a new creation, a new person. The old life is gone, the new life has begun. Anyone, anyone can become renewed, redeemed, saved. Next phrase is, is in Christ. This promise is only for those found in Christ. It's not for those who have positive thoughts. It's not for those who come to church. It's not for those who come to 412 Youth. It's not for those who serve in the church, who help with Panera Bread, who help clean up the church, who help at events who go serve uh, the community. It's not for those who highlight you version Bible verses or put scriptural memes up on the uh, uh, interwebs or on Facebook or Snapchat or, or TikTok. It's not for those who 
are trusting in themselves or trusting in others because all of those things can be done outside of Christ. We can post the nicest scriptural message in a meme image on Facebook and not be in Christ. We can serve the poor. We can serve the rich. We could serve all of them. We could be outside helping out people. We could be cleaning the church. We can be helping other people. We can be doing wonderful things and still be outside of Christ, outside of redemption, still broken and lost. So the question is, how are we found in Christ? How are you in Christ? On your notes, you see several words, and um, these are really simple. Some, we've talked about this many times. We've even talked some even prior to now in this message. First, we need to come to grips with this thing called sin, why we're broken. Romans 3.23 says this, all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious sin. All, everybody, everybody. <laughs> Nicest person you know, the most bootleg, wretched, no good, low life person. Yet, yeah. all have sinned. The second word is death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's the worst possible result of any sin. All of sins, the wages of sin is death. No matter if there's a person that's out, out shot up the whole neighborhood and God forbid had killed some little babies in, in a house that weren't even part of that, that uh, beef or that gang situation to someone who just plagiarized somebody's essay for a stupid little school sign. Sin. All that sin leads to death. All that sin is a horrible to God. There's no like gradations like, oh God who looks at this one but doesn't look at this one, all have sinned. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's love involved there. Romans 5a says this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet not given a rip about God, while we were yet doing our thing, just being about, well, this makes me feel good. This helps me out. This, this is what is nice. This is what is cool. This is, this is what is natural to me. This is what um, just feels like the thing I need to be doing. And we are blind in our sin and don't care about God. While we're yet sinners, Christ showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die. Faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. God saved you. God redeemed you. God renews you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things you have done, so none of us can boast about it. So, for instance, we could, a person could be like, yo, you know what? I came and I helped do Panera Bread like 300 days a year. And I, I also gave like $5 million to the church and to these charities. And I, I also built homes for the poor. And I also lobbied Congress for poverty and did all these great things. God, look, look, I deserve to be saved. And we could boast about it. The problem is some of us don't have those resources to do that. Some of us don't have 300 days a year to just do Panera Bread in the community. Some of us don't have those things. Some of us barely have money to pay Nipsco. This is the beauty of Jesus. The, 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 the ground at the foot of the cross is level. For the rich and the poor. For the connected and the not connected. For those that have it all together by world standards and those who are a little bit out there. All are welcome at the foot of the cross. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. 
If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, redeemed, renewed. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. This is a question. Last week, we ended with the question, what do we do with the outreached hand of Jesus? Do we slap away his outreached hand and say, I'm good? Or do we grab onto it? For us today, a, a, a thought of which we need to consider is, what do we do with his offer of renewal, of the changed heart? Are we still wanting to be blind and caught in our own stuff? And it's like, I'm good, God. I, 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 I'm cool. I'll continue to come to church. I'll continue to come to youth. I'll continue to serve in those type of ways. It makes me feel good. It kind of gets me connected to different things. But really, to really follow you, to do what you want me to do, to, to accept your gift of salvation, I, I, I'm good. When I get older... Or next year, when, when, when my to-do list is done, when I get the situation paid for, when, when I get around to a guy, I'm good. What will you do? Will you accept what Jesus has offered? Or will you just, eh. You see, we're not just forgiven but we are changed into a new creation. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, and I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart, a heart that is uh, one that begins to beat again, start to get in sync with the heart of God, one that begins to Build compassion, one that begins to beat with grace, one that begins to seek out truth, one that begins to beat after Jesus. You see, growing up, it used to really irritate me when church folks expected non-church folks to behave like they had come to know Jesus as Savior. That they they that they weren't they weren't supposed to do things that they were doing. They're doing the things that their unchanged heart is leading them to do. It feels good. It, it works out for them. It, it helps them out. It, it scratches an itch. It provides for their greed. It, fulfills their envy, it satisfies their lust, it, whatever the case is. But it's reasonable then for us to begin to think if we have come to Jesus and we're not only forgiven, but he's given us a new heart to expect to, for us to be changed and changing. We are forgiven in a moment of time when we place our faith in Christ, accept what he's done, and put our faith in him. That is being saved and redeemed. We are set free. We are free. But there's also a process of changing ourselves. If you ever cook bacon at home, and you're cooking bacon, and you leave the crib, and you're going to work, you're going to smell like what? Bacon. Bacon. You might have even changed your clothes. And if you have any hair, your hair might smell like bacon. There is a process of getting that bacon smell off of you. You might have, you're not, right now at the job, you're not cooking bacon. You're not eating bacon. You can say beef bacon if you're not into the swine. You can, if you're not into any meat, it could be vegan bacon. Whatever the case is, that smell gets on you and it sticks on you. And there's a process of getting yourself 
totally clean. Same with Christ. You come to Christ, you're forgiven, you're set free, you're clean. But there's also a process of it becoming increasingly changed to conform to the image of Christ. Because we still got a little bit of stank on us. We still got some envy. We still got some lust. We still got some selfishness. We still got some greed. We still got some, I don't give up about this. We still got fill in the blank. We still want to go do certain things. You see, God does the renewing, but he doesn't do it for us. He does it in us. There's a difference there. This means we have an active role. This means us allowing God to do his work in us by pursuing godly things, a choice of our will to begin to pursue godly things. It makes no sense for someone who doesn't know Jesus, hasn't had this changed heart. Like, why would you even want to read God's word? Like, for real? Why? That doesn't make sense. Like, other than interesting literature, maybe, or fascinating history, or it's a big book. Like, why would I want to engage God's word? However, when God begins to do a work in our heart, now there is this birth of a desire, something that doesn't make like logical sense sometimes to begin to consume, to pursue godly things. It means laying down, surrendering. Song during our worship time. Fill me up, Lord. You provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice. So often, so often, self-included, I want God to provide the fire and I want him to provide the sacrifice because sure as I am living, I don't want to sacrifice this thing over here. I want to still do my thing over here. Sometimes where nobody sees. Sometimes I want to engage in things that I know is not right. I just want to do it. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel like, hmm, whatever. It makes me feel like, man, that person did me wrong. And when I can think about what they did me wrong in my creative, ultra petty way of wanting to deal with it, I feel super powerful, like I'm Hulk. Because I can pull on that negative energy and it can fuel me to do some things. I have to sacrifice. Surrender, lay down our stubborn will, set aside deep preferences that aren't godly, set aside a love for sin, and begin to put into practice what God lays out for us. You see, Jesus reached to renew. Jesus reached Not just for the sake of reaching, not for the sake of being cool, not for the sake of making people feel good. But he reached to renew, to redeem, to to buy back, to save the lost. And scripture is very clear. Everyone is lost without Jesus. Jesus reached to renew. So then we reach out so others will experience renewal they too can become redeemed they too can become saved so as we wrap up this morning two questions I want to leave you in general first one is this is are you in Christ have you accepted Have you confessed? Have you willfully followed Jesus? I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about reading scripture. I'm not talking about any any of that. Those things are good. I'm talking about surrendering your heart to Jesus. Second question is this. I have 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, the old is gone. The question is, is the old gone? So out of that, there's probing questions for you to consider and you to wrestle with the Lord on is what's still active in your life? 
that is contrary to who God is. What is still active in your life that is contrary to who God is. And how much time and attention is given to God versus yourself, your flesh, your sin. Is the old gone? God wants to do amazing work in and through your life. It starts by him reaching out to you. But it's not simply for you to feel good or to feel religious or to be condemned, but that you would be saved, that you would be redeemed, that you would be renewed. It's an amazing act of love that takes you from where you were to where he wants you to be. And then there's the process of becoming like him. And that involves us, an act of our wills, to surrender, to become more like Jesus.